So today's episode will be uh, what we could call a roadmap to bikini physique. What it actually is, what training it incorporates, maybe even like differences in nutrition between bikini and something else. Because most women probably will consider, hey, if I'm going to the gym, I'm going to look like bikini chick. I just need to train. But we both know you need to have a mindset to even get there. Then you have to have a specific routine of exercise you're going to do to look like that. Maybe even some kind of nutrition that, that is different, let's say, if you were a strong woman uh, or doing just long distance running and those kind of things. Uh, to me, the most important thing always is mindset. But I would really like to know which which one is yours and how do you kind of break it all down and whatnot. And what does it come to your mind when you think about what roadmap to bikini physique? What are the first thoughts in your head? Uh, it's it's evolved a little bit over the times. Um, I think my first thought now when I get, if I get a client that's never done it and they want to do it, my first thought is, it's a lot harder than you think um, because the level of leanness, the level of extreme that the one category or the one organization, I should say that everyone seems to aim for has taken this category. Um, it, it's just not that it's just not that sustainable um, for most people. It's very, very difficult. So my first, Thoughts are okay. Well, let's see if if you got it in you. Like I have um, quite a few clients that I've been working with for many, many, many years, seasoned competitors now, and they are in this organization. And the level of leanness that this organization continues to evolve to is pushing them further. I have a client right now in prep. She's leaner. She checked in with me two days ago. She's leaner right now, nine weeks out. And when she won the overall in the same organization six years ago, because the level of leanness they need now is evolved so much, and mm. the the amount of muscularity they need now is changed so much. I was about that, to say because now probably is uh, we have trained bikini as well and whatnot in like in in UK, and they look like pretty much like physique and and bodybuilders used to look like fifteen years ago. Yeah, and that's you have to expect that because. The, the winners, like the Olympians, they're drugged hard. And if they win, they have to defend their title the following year. So now they're going to be on drugs for another year. And so they're evolving, and you have to match them. And since they're more muscular, they're leaner, they're bigger, they're stronger, they're all these things, the category kind of goes with them. So the bikini category today now looks like Miss Olympia bodybuilding from the 80s. You know, it looks like last year's or, you know, last, I don't know, five years ago, figure girls. Like, so it's extreme now. In fact, it's to the point where we've talked about this before, where the ones doing well aren't doing well naturally anymore. I don't even think it's possible. There will be the outlier for sure. But for most of us, it's not impossible to be competitive at the bikini level anymore as a natural athlete in the IFBB organization. But I guess it would depend on the organization because there are other ones that are a little bit more you know, I guess, softer look, more like... Um, so I before we even go there, work. I'm really interested to, to hear your thoughts. So IBB NPCs, they will have higher standards for that. Mm -hmm. Is it even healthy to get to that level of leanness without any kind of performance-enhancing drugs, supplements, or anything like that? No, not... I mean, for the short term period, you're going to have health markers that are skewed, um, hormone values that are just in the gutter, um, and that's not healthy. Um, so, but if it was just temporarily, you'll be fine. But the problem is, you couldn't keep yourself there long enough because it's just not it's just not a sustainable lifestyle um, to get to that level of extreme. So, big picture, no, it's not healthy. But I wouldn't be overly concerned because you wouldn't be able to stay there long enough, anyways. But if somebody were to step off stage and check their bloods, you would see all kinds of markers out of whack for sure, especially if they were natural. So what uh, what does it require to like mentally get there to, to become a bikini athlete? Can someone with, let's say, full-time job, family, and all those kind of things even get there to today's standards? 
I think there will be some females that are able to do it, um, but it's going to depend on their lifestyle and their ability to organize their lifestyle. If they have genetics on their side, um, natural or not, if they have the ability to train, I would say three or four times a week, they probably can do it. Um, it's going to be more difficult with the more you know, hectic of a lifestyle or, or more hectic of a schedule, but it's totally doable. And it depends on the individual. I have some people that, you know, are single, no kids, no families, no nothing, and they struggle to get stuff done. And I have, um, you know, career women that are in a full-time career, married with kids, and they step on stage and do well all the time. So it kind of depends on the person um, and the, obviously their ability to deal with it because it is going to require a commitment especially if you're going to go take it to that stage. That level of leanness now is going to push your body to the point where you, you've probably never experienced. And it's a lot different today than it was even five years ago. So what would you say is an effective training plan for someone who's trying to achieve bikini look? Another thing is, is there a an advantage for somebody who has been physically active earlier in their life, because I, I find there is massive difference if somebody has had exposure to track and field or whatever, whereas now a lot of kids, they are not even asked to do any sports lessons. So let's say somebody who was in their early 2000s and whatnot in school, they were still kind of physically active. Yeah, they probably didn't do anything for five, 10 years. Now they hit the gym, they get really good results really quick. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. do, do you see that as well? Is is there something to it? Yeah, definitely. There's Because muscle memory is a real thing. So some of those people that have been active or competitive in other sports in the past, they've developed some amount of muscle mass and it's there. I mean, it can be, you know, dormant but it's easily to wake that up. You know, the structure has been built. You've just sort of shut the lights off in the building where somebody that's never been doing any of this stuff, they still actually have to build the building. So you, you've got that little bit of an advantage. Um, plus you've also got this, you've experienced hard work. And I'm not saying that someone that didn't do sports hasn't had, you know, deal with hard work, but you know, what it's like to be, you know, to push your body, you know, it's like to be competitive. You have a lot of other things mindset wise that are going to be beneficial that though I don't really consider bodybuilding in, in general as a sport. I mean, it, it, it does require um, a very dedicated mindset, much like a, a professional athlete would have. Um, and that's not for everybody. Some people just can't commit to the level of, I guess, commitment they need. So talk to me about uh, training. What's uh... Is there a difference between somebody who is just want a bikini body and somebody who just goes in and squats a lot and does a lot of deadlifts? Will those two girls look the same? Because you, you will have somebody who loves just deadlifting. Right? Just whatever you do, just put put me some deadlifts in, in. And we kind of know, you know, risk reward ratio and the fatigue, you, you might be more beneficial by doing something else. And then that might lead you to achieve the physique you actually are after quicker than if you didn't do these things that you kind of love. So what uh, is there a template for women to follow in the sense of training that will give them that nice round glutes and maybe a little bit of shoulders and not too big of a chest and stuff like that? There's, um, there's a template in the sense of the category requires a certain look, a certain X factor silhouette. So we know that's not changing. The goal is to look with like a very streamlined waist, develop glutes, shoulder caps, et cetera. So the template is kind of dictated by the category, but the exercise selection, there's never going to be a template because everyone's going to be different. If I have a female that is quad dominant and we need to develop glutes, I'm not going to have her squatting. It, it doesn't make much sense to me to squat when she's already quad dominant because we have to create proportions. Um, and that's going to be the same for all the muscles that you need to build. If you have to focus on lateral delts, you know, anterior delt, whatever, glutes, maximus, medius, whatever, you have to use the right tool for the job for that individual. And that's where the exercise selection becomes so crucial. And that's where I see most people getting things wrong is they are getting a template. I've never had a female 
in my career deadlift unless deadlifting was part of another goal and we could afford to incorporate them both i've had them use variations of deadlifts like romanian deadlifts etc but a bikini athlete is not going to pull a barbell off the floor on stage so there's no need and since the deadlift is really hitting your entire posterior chain completely but not really specifically targeting any muscle group completely it doesn't make like a very good choice i feel the same way about deadlifts for uh, an aesthetically driven bodybuilder it's not the greatest exercise if they're trying to create proportions isolation movements become a little bit more relevant but it does depend on the individual um and then i guess really their goal i mean if it's strictly to look like the bikini model they're not going to be deadlifting they're going to be doing things that develop the glutes if needed and then you have to determine what part of the glute are we trying to develop more um and then obviously your quads and shoulders so the template is really like i said the silhouette of the of the category would deadlift ever be your choice for anyone uh, who is going into aesthetics maybe um but not for the aesthetic part of their look, but maybe for the Im amount of muscle fiber recruitment you get from deadlifts, the mindset, all these things that would indirectly help me develop their physique through other means. Um, it would be incorporated temporarily here and there, different phases of their training, but I wouldn't just have anyone come in and deadlift. I think the media, social media has kind of run rampant over the last decade where, you know, office females or or new moms have you know come into the gym and their trainer has them deadlifting their body weight in a matter of a few weeks um and then in a matter of six months later they've herniated a disc like it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to just throw that on everybody because it is a very technical movement and it does put a lot of force in a lot of areas of the body and it needs to be trained i think appropriately and the adaptations need to come along with the ride because you can out stress certain compound certain components of your body you, females are much much stronger than they realize when it comes to actual their muscle contractions like for example a hip thrust you'll see females like oh i thrusted like 50 pounds or 100 pounds i bet you they could thrust 200 no problem i mean i i sometimes if i have them in my studio here i sometimes say give them a scenario like okay put this you know barbell on your on your hips and thrust it now what if that was like somebody that you know pinned you down or something and you didn't want that you don't think you could buck off more than 50 pounds like my daughter could buck off 100 pounds and she weighs 75 so i think it kind of depends on what they're doing but with the deadlift you can put a lot of sheer force through your low your low back and if you haven't spent the time to adapt the tissues that protect that you'll be able to lift more just from the actual pulley movement of the lift then your spine might be able to take right out of the gate. So sometimes these adaptations take a little longer. Ligaments and tendons don't move to the same pace as muscles. So the deadlift is a fantastic tool for sure, but it doesn't have much place in my eyes for a bikini athlete unless they have this other desire to, you know, deadlift a lot of weight. And I do have a few that are very keen on, I want to be able to pull X amount of weight but I want to look bikini and realistically you can do both to a degree, but at some point you're going to have to veer off. Like if the goal is strictly bikini look at some point, the deadlift has to take off. So when you talk about your training and maybe the exercise selection and whatnot, how important it is to change your training plan often? <laughs> Not important. <laughs> uh, that's the best question because I actually have a, a new client, um, and she was being trained by an IFBB pro and they were changing the exercises every four weeks. And the IFBB pro told her it's because you have to shock the muscle and change it up. Well, really, we're trying to cause adaptation. And the very initial adaptations you get strength training are neurological. And once those neurological adaptations have occurred, you're going to slowly now start to get those morphological changes where you're going to increase lean contractile tissue. But it's not going to happen in the first three or four weeks, minimally. And now you've gone and changed it again. And then you get these people chasing soreness as indicators of good workouts. And we, well, you're going to be sore if you change your exercise every three, four weeks. I try not to change your exercises if I can until I need to, because I've already chosen the best exercise for the goal. 
And if that exercise is no longer beneficial, I'm by default going to the next best exercise, which now makes it the best because the first one's ran its course. But sometimes they don't run their course. So to just change it for the sake of changing it, it is to me um, a problem with the mindset of the of the athlete. If they need to change it up because their compliance is being threatened, they're probably already not cut out, already not cut out for this because changing it just to keep you going, that's not how it works. You need to build what you need to build to look the part. And if changing the exercises keeps you going, I feel like you're selling yourself short. Yeah, if you need to build glutes, you you build glutes with what builds glutes, not to try to yeah. find different yeah, variations exactly. just to get a bit different look from Instagram viewers and whatnot. Yeah, so, and and the whole the gl whole glute building thing online right now is going through like wars with like squats versus hip thrusts and yada yada yada. I don't understand why it's such a big deal. What what all the controversy about it? T to me, it's super super obvious. They both build glutes. They both do very good job of building glutes. But if, like I said, if I have somebody that's very quad dominant, the squat is just not going to be the option anymore. It just doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense because I will never be able to bring the shoulder caps in in proportion with the quads so it just isn't going to work and I, if i still have to be developing the glutes um and same thing if i don't have that problem sure we can squat all day long the squatting is an excellent exercise but there is no perfect exercise for anyone but there is a perfect exercise for the division based on that person's anatomical variances and what they need you know if you don't need shoulders even though that's important for the category you might not need to train them as often so what about nutrition? Are there any things that uh, people who are just getting into training and, hey, I want to build this bikini body, I want to get leaner, I want to get around their muscle. So is there anything specifically they need to focus on to improve their muscle building abilities, improve their fat burning abilities, improve their energy levels and uh, things like that? And is there something that needs to change throughout the process at all? Um. Yeah, for sure. And that's a big question because it depends on where they are in their journey. If this is just the first time bucket list check to see if we're into that or not, you want to make sure that you've got enough time to get lean enough. Um, and when it comes to the food, protein matters the most. You need to have adequate protein. After that, it doesn't really matter that lot that much depending on what the type of training is you're doing to achieve the goal. If I have to get leaner, I have to be in an energy deficit. No food makes me burn fat better or not. It's just the amount of food I'm eating in general. Um, bikini athletes are notoriously given very, very low carbohydrate diets and tons and tons of aerobic activity um, to get lean. And of course that will work to a point Usually when you hear of things like two, three, four hours, I actually just recently heard of a girl doing four hours of cardio uh, a day. Um, that's usually because the timeline was screwed up right from the beginning. Um, so I would say what matters most is protein gets in there. Carbs and fats are really going to be based on compliance at that point, assuming there is enough carbs to fuel the type of train that we need to do for the goal. If we needed to be doing some higher intensity things, there needs to be a little bit more relevance put on carbohydrates. If not, it's not as important. And then obviously there needs to be some fats just for overall health, but most of that's going to be covered from your protein intake um, and then some essential fatty acids alongside it. So how about food quality? Because we know everyone is obsessed now if it fits your mouth approach and things like that, and they just count calories. And so what, what, how big of a role is food quality play in? for someone trying to rebuild their physique as well as energy levels and, and just enjoying it all together? I think that's a good question because I'm kind of um, at the point of wanting to make some, you know, ranting posts about this kind of stuff. Food quality matters extremely much when it comes to long-term longevity, overall your health markers, et cetera. It's very important. Um, even the book I wrote, the nutrition book I wrote talks about, like, uh, I would say 80% of your foods should be wholesome, nutritious foods, you know, butcher produce aisle and 20% eat whatever you want. And that's going to be more than enough for a lifetime. And let's and be honest, 20% for bikini chick is not a lot. No, 
no. Um, and it's not going to be slice of cheesecake every night. <laughs> and there will be people that can get to stage. I've I've had clients do it with that if it fits your macros crap. Um, I think that's a very good way of living life in general, eating you know wholesome foods, etc. Um, but just kind of fitting them how you need to. But the problem with that if, if it fits your macros is that which got trendy. I don't know. 15 years ago or whatever from that um, that one cocky guy in the States. I can't, can't remember his name. Uh, but anyways, there's a nutritional error margin on labels. And it's quite big, 20, 30% it can be. And so if people are constantly changing their foods just because they're trying to get stage lean and eating fucking cupcakes, that error margin is going to catch you. And, that's, and I see it catch them every single time, especially today where the level of leanness now has no room for error. I have a and, client that two weeks uh, out. Uh, sorry, th sorry. And I believe it's very different in uh, Europe compared to US and everywhere else because rules for labels are completely different as well. For sure. Yeah, for sure. I have a client right now. It's three weeks out from a show and we're at the level of leanness now I needed her to be. I put her on a meal plan uh, seven weeks ago. And in seven weeks, she made... The progress has taken her about 30 weeks to make with the if it fits your macros. Um, and it's because she's constantly baking and making all these things and making them fit her macros according to a label. And you can you can think whatever you want about those labels. At the end of the day, if your body is not losing body fat, you're not in a deficit. Mm. End of story. So there's going to be a point where the if it fits your macros or intuitive eating um, works. Like I say, for non-competitors, I think intuitive eating is the way to do things for overall, you know, ease of mind and not being obsessive. But today's standard of leanness, I think eventually they're going to have to get to a pretty stringent way of eating, at least for the last couple months, um, which you'd almost want anyways, because you want to get to the point again, because the level of leanness today you want to get to the point now where you're actually consistent with your electrolytes as well. Sodium, potassium, your hydration level. That needs to start becoming very consistent for the last few weeks. And you can't do that if you're constantly changing foods. So when it comes to nutrition, I don't know if you're agreeing. Well, uh, would you say it would be useful for anyone who's trying to do this, try to achieve some kind of physique development with single ingredient foods first, just to see how different it is? because your body will change and how it deals with food will change as well when mm -hmm. you get leaner and when you do achieve that physique that you wanted to now you can revert to more flexible type of eating without any detrimental effects instead of trying to be as flexible as you can from get-go never getting anywhere getting frustrated blaming everyone's taking drugs and i'm not changing because i'm not taking drugs and so on and so forth Yes, and I completely agree with you. And I think it's also um, important that the client's mindset, because scale weight really drives a lot of females' um, moods for the day even. And if you're constantly changing foods, you're constantly going to be changing body weight fluctuations. And that can be very derailing for um, any type of you know journey, fitness, health journey, diet journey, whatever. I think... And I preach this to all my clients. We set the foundation with that 80% wholesome foods, not labeled, not frozen, not processed. 80% from the butcher, from the produce, whatever. Develop that and make that kind of home base. And that's going to take care of pretty much all we need to worry about. And then from there, you can put in what you need in terms of cravings or whatever with your 20% of, you know, freedom and then you're going to find that you're going to have to tighten that up as you get closer and closer just because the 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 extreme of the condition the extreme condition of the categories now is so much higher um but you don't want to be i don't want to be encouraging trying to live and preach this healthy lifestyle but trying to fit cupcakes in all the time like it's just i don't understand the point of why you're trying to look a certain way and eating foods that you know really aren't really meant for that. It's almost like you're, you know, contradicting yourself. And I, and I think you're going to just run into the problem where you just can't do it. 
just from the sheer fact that the ingredients you are, of everything you're making and the labels are going to kick you out of your deficit. You touched up a little bit on mindset, and I think that's probably a good topic to go into. Are there any kind of lifestyle things that women can incorporate to build this resilience to not how can i even nicely describe it not fear of being judged you know someone's gonna say something about you all the time hey this is not good that is not good but um, like when i work with clients my my number one goal is for them to become a leader for whatever societies they're living in you know a little group hey i want you to step up and show your family how it is done your friends how it's done whoever is looking up to you in gym how it's done they're gonna laugh at you they will they will try to derail you all the time mm -hmm. but you have to be that person who changes everything so is there anything that you would suggest your girls to go and say like hey you know what once a week i want you to go in nature or hang out with friends or Something that takes away with that obsession from I just need to look this certain way that actually appreciates that they are already looking great, but now they are just focusing on stepping up and asking a bit more from themselves, not for the sake of looking <clears throat> great and everyone is drooling around them, but in for the sake of being healthier and, and just leading by example that, hey, we need to look out after ourselves as much as we can. Yeah, it's really it's really hard because everyone's so different. But I do try to because I meet with my clients either in person or, or virtually weekly, um, and we spend a, between thirty and sixty minutes of a, like a check in, and I do just listen and try to offer suggestions when I feel like something is potentially an obsessive thought process happening. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so I don't know, but I'm just offering my two cents. Like I have a client right now that's prepping. Like I said, she's three weeks out. And she told me when she checked on the weekend, she's already starting to plan what she's going to eat after the show. So then right away, I'm like, okay, well, let's let's talk about this here for a second because that's not a road you want to go down. It's dangerous. It's, um, it's not an eating disorder. They would call it disordered eating, but it can lead to eating disorders. Uh, and it's dangerous, but oftentimes the women are becoming obsessive because from what I've seen, because they're getting results eating that food that they've put in a Tupperware container that their coach said they had to eat had to be, you know, three ounces of chicken with two ounces of, you know, had to be sweet potato. Cause if any other potato would fucking ruin you and uh, you know, a cup of green beans or whatever. Um, and so now they think that that food is magic and there's nothing magic about any of those foods. That food just gave you a certain amount of energy and that energy was very easy for your coach to give that to all of his clients and very easy for him to ma manipulate, you know, from three ounces, we'll go to two, same food, same food, same food. So all they're doing is keeping everything consistent. And that starts to get this obsessive behavior. So I try to encourage that 80, 20 rule with the food, which I think helps. And then I try to encourage them to step away from the gym, especially if they're family orientated as often as they can. But something I actually, and this I don't know if this is maybe slightly off topic, but it popped in my head because of your question is um, females that have daughters, I think, and I work with quite a few, I think it's extra important that they're being very careful with what sort of example they're setting. I've had two 14-year-old female teens that had eating disorders hire me, um, and I had to be interviewed by their mom. And so the one mom interviewed me and I was on the phone with her for two hours and the entire time the mom kept making comments to me. She's a, she's a coach and she kept making comments to me about how, when she lowers her carbs, her weight does this. And when she cuts out carbs, her weight does that. And always cutting carbs, cutting carbs, cutting carbs. Her daughter stopped eating carbs. And lo and behold, her daughter was literally now in a in a in the hospital actually for this eating disorder. And I think a lot of that stemmed right from what she was seeing at home. Kids are very observant, whether you realize it or not, they're picking things up. So it's super important that females aren't being hyper obsessive with their food choices in front of everybody. And that's why knowing and understanding your foods and intuitive eating is very important. It's a very important skill. But also understand that at some point you might have to tighten that down for the last little last little bit of time for your show but that's because the stage is such an extreme thing 
you need to have balance before you can begin stepping into that extreme level because otherwise stepping off stage you're going to be lost yeah so, sadly in competitive level i see that all, most women who compete they they already have some kind of disordered eating and they yeah. feel like hey i'm gonna take this under control I, I feel in control but then after they stop competing it usually goes in sideways again uh yeah. so to, to to me personally anyone who wants to improve their physique uh they should focus on their health first and health and lean body doesn't really go together <laughs> yeah yeah so understanding that difference is so important and then if you understand it that hey if i'm really lean i'm not really healthy yeah go for it but if you think oh i'm lean and i'm healthy and it's just not possible so uh yeah how, how about yourself yeah i agree man i totally agree but now we're gonna leave leave it on this note, and next week we're gonna we're gonna dwell deeper in uh, maybe about bikini body blueprint, so to speak. Uh, what okay. body parts, how to get the where, how uh, would be really interesting okay. to find out about what exercises bring up this part of the body and that part of the body. But uh, I'm gonna I'm mindful of your time, and I'll let you off, and I'll speak to you next video. That sounds great. Okay, perfect. Oh, <laughs> my